everybody. Welcome to episode 253 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. It's a great interview uh, with Disna Wirasinghe, a great immigration attorney, employment based uh, out in the East Coast around Pennsylvania. She was kind enough to contribute an article about I 140s and the ability to pay issue in the most latest issue of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox Magazine. It's not the latest issue, actually, the pre we brought previous to it. Uh, but check out her article there and listen to the interview to learn her background and how she got to where she is. A great resource, a very kind person. Uh, if you want to check out the magazine, go to immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com and click on the magazine tab or immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com slash magazine. You can check them all out there. I want to thank the sponsors. DocuWise has always been so supportive of the podcast and of the magazine itself. You can get additional 10% off the annual plan by going to Immigration Lawyers Toolbox. I'm sorry, that's not where you go at all. It's DocuWise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash toolbox uh, and uh, use the code immigration lawyers toolbox and check it out. You know, call them up, email them and do a test if you're trying to switch up from one uh, software to another and see how they're doing and compare. I think they'll be happy with that. Um, some housekeeping stuff I want to mention. Hope you stick around and not fast forward this part because it's really important. I want to set up a workshop or planning on setting a workshop for immigration or training in Los Angeles live the first quarter of uh, 2023. In preparation for that, I really want to get the word out. Tell your friends and, and let me know if you come and join. It's going to be a lot of fun. Not only is it going to be educational, but we're going to party and have a good time. And you know, Los Angeles is always sunny. So it's, I've been mentioning this, uh, this, this, this workshop, and I thought a bunch of people in LA are going to contact me, but almost everybody has been in Florida, New Jersey, all these East Coast people are going to fly down. So it's going to be a, a really good time, uh, and we're going to have a, a bash. Probably going to be about employment based, probably going to be beginner to intermediate. Uh, um, employment-based stuff so you can learn new skills uh, how to make money and people who do basic and employment stuff could get next level stuff we're gonna have great practitioners and experts you saw all of the, the caliber of people who ring on the magazine the podcast we're just going to keep that kind of stuff going and keep it going higher so just email me at info at immigration toolbox.com so i'll know i get a head count of people that are coming in i could plan it better but you're going to be hearing more and more about it as we set it up and, and, and the program and everything's there. I'm going to be there, obviously, and I really look forward to meeting a person, get so many emails and Zoom videos we do with, with uh, all the listeners. I can't wait to just have a good time and see you all in person. So keep that in mind. And we've also developed a community uh, on page. So in addition, I have courses and CLEs, but it's kind of a one-off when people join there or do that. Um, I created, I got some community software uh, and where people could go and we could ask questions and answers there in a private forum not have to deal with Facebook and whether they show it or not, how to find a previous posting. It's all there along with tips and answers we're always going to be providing to have a different level of, of, of training and response and, and updates and communication between the immigration bar. So if you're interested in joining that group, uh, email me again, info at immigration or toolbox.com. So testing out the software and finding the time to, to do it properly. Uh, but we're going to have teams on it. Your participation is pivotal and, and much appreciated. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's just a really important part uh, right there. If you want to join again, just email me at info at immigration toolbox.com. One last note is my internet is choppy. So um, this part of this recording, especially at the beginning, kind of cut in and out. I edited the gaps where the computer froze and stuff like that. But if you notice that uh, it's not your computer, it's just a recording, but it gets better after the first few minutes. And, uh, you know, general education purposes only, uh, consult an attorney, you know, the disclaimers, we're lawyers, we always got to say this stuff, but hope you enjoy. Today we're talking with Disna Wirasinghe. Thank you so much for coming on today, Disna. Um, let's jump into it. You, you contributed a great article. Thank you for having me, John. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. The internet has a little bit uh, back and forth, so I kind of jumped in there. But yeah, again, thanks for, thanks for coming on the show. I wanted to reference a wonderful uh, article you wrote about uh, the ability to pay uh, issues for I-140 hour fees, which many people get all the time. But before that, mm -hmm. let's uh, let's learn about yourself. Disney. Where? How did you get involved in immigration? How did you just where'd you grow up, and how'd you get here? So your question is sort of like two prong question. Where did I come from, and how did I become it? Right. Yeah. So let me the first part of it. Um, I grew up in Sri Lanka, India. It used to call Ceylon. Um, so it's a tropical island. So early on, I was used to this islanders uh, lifestyle. A lot of sort of like laid back lifestyle. Yeah. A lot of beaches around us and a lot of holidays to spend um, time. And... Uh, Tropical fruits, vegetation, scenic uh, landscape, and all that. So these days, people used to call it a paradise. <laughs> and 
yeah. And in that paradise, I met my husband. So he wanted to come to the United States. I kind of tagged along. So that's how I came into the United States. Once I came here, I was totally, totally isolated. Because coming from an island, uh, it's sort of like if you go to Thai Square and you see a lot of people, and then you come to suburban Philadelphia, which is not, not as much, right? So, so I, I got really isolated and um, eventually met friends. And then um, someone I met suggested, because I was an attorney before, and he was like, this not thought of that. Cause like I've been to law school, I wanna go back. But then I thought like, why not? So I went to Widener University School of Law. I did the corporate law and finance program. Mm -hmm. Was also worked at the circulation desk and uh, research assistantship as well as technical processing department. While I'm at the um, circulation desk, there was this attorney one day came in and he, gave, he showed me a book and said, Krishna, you should read this. And I was like, what? And, and it was an immigration law book. You know, it was like in and out and taking notes and all that. It was business immigration work, how to get it from the H1 to uh, Green. So after I read that book, know anything uh, 245 is that time but um i thought like i can do my own um, green card so i did yeah. and it got an approved so that's when i decided to be a business immigration attorney but you know that that thought has to wait uh, for a long time because i got another opportunity to work for a judge mm -hmm. uh, yeah so that, that's how i became um, thought of of becoming immigrant, I then moved to the Supreme Court of Man. Uh, I spent time with them, and then I said, "Go back to uh, becoming an immigration attorney," and, and wanted to uh, fulfill my dream. Wonderful! And so, so you had your law practice for almost ten years. Uh, yeah, your I am. Practice. Yes. What I think. Uh, yeah. Yes. What I mean, what what made you make your own firm? Because a lot of people uh, are hesitant to do that. They're, they're kind of you know maybe afraid is too strong a word, but it's a it's a big move. What caused you to start your own firm? Well, in life, we get curveballs, right? So I started um, in a small but immigration law. Time is it's demanding, right? So kids at that. And I was kind of uh, kind of doing my immigration law practice with the with the law firm, but I'm not essentially taking care of kids. But they have a lot of issues to attend and all that. Yeah. So I decided if myself and my own boss, so I have time, so I I can take only the cases I want to take, yeah. and it's not somebody is telling me you have to finish and this and that. So I, I can manage well the work-life balance. So yeah. that is the reason I started. And I was able to do that um, by helping my kids as well as uh, practicing. How so many that is the reason. I'm sorry? How, how many children do you have? Oh, I have two. Wonderful. They're not uh, kids, but <laughs> those kids. <laughs> Wonderful. So you had your own firm, and, and, and your focus is on employment-based on the EB categories and the non-immigrant visas. Uh, and then you made the switch and you worked for uh, Cognizant, which is probably one of the largest, essentially an immigration law firm in the world, probably behind the scenes with the volume that they do. Yes, um, yes. And I'm sure there's a lot of stories there. <laughs> but <laughs> you see a lot of stuff with that amount of volume. Uh, but now uh, you yeah. work another firm in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Are you in Florida right now yourself or is it the, the headquarters is there? Um, our headquarters is there, and I'm working a virtual. I'm a virtual attorney, mm -hmm. and we have a small boutique law firm with the attorneys there. So we are pretty busy. I mean, crazy busy, like uh, cognizant, which files like thirteen thousand something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are busy. Yeah. The, 
I think like we can pay a lot of attention when we uh, intake and I'm um, really happy to work here. Wonderful. We kind of doing like HRs as um, e, e cases and uh, perm I want to buy V1. That's our forte, but we take uh, employment base, we take comes in. Yeah, and also it lists there that uh, you're a DTM Toastmasters International. What what is a DTM? DTM means distinguished Toastmaster. So to become distinguished Toastmaster, it's a you know public speaking uh, forum. So to become a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest honor you can get it from Toastmasters International, mm -hmm. um, you just have to start with uh, their program. Basically, I did the traditional program, which has like, I believe speeches plus a big, big one means like one of each. Um, now they have pathways, which type of program, it's totally online. I'm thinking of starting that just to keep it up because I don't want to become rusty, uh, yeah. what I learned. So that's that's something I have to do for myself. I'm how long ago? How long ago did you start with Toastmasters? I started Toastmasters in, I believe, 2011, December. Uh, yeah, yeah. So and I... Uh, so it has. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Books. It has four books, ten speeches in each. The first book is introdu introducing yourself, and um, then the uh, how to write a speech, the structure per se, and then how to add gestures, mm -hmm. and uh, removing the redundant words such as a lot of people use you knows, yeah. so and things like that. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to learn how to become um, a public speaker if, you, if someone wants to do that. You know, that's something uh, every immigration lawyer has to do. Like, uh, what, how, do you, how did you decide on which group to choose? Because I know like every group has their own culture and stuff like that. Did you go to different ones or did the, was the first meeting that you went that it hit the spot and you stayed there? What do you mean by different groups? Well, here, I looked it up here at Toastmasters in like Los Angeles, and there's like 50 different Toastmasters oh. groups to choose from, uh, subgroups, I guess, where they meet up. Right. So initially, I did not know who Toastmasters were, right? Mm -hmm. So one of my friends said, um, because I was looking for a public uh, speaking group, and one of my friends said, why don't you join Toastmasters? So I thought like a bunch of people, you know, toasting. I don't know what it was. <laughs> so I, <laughs> seriously, so I decided to go. Uh, there were like four clubs around me. You can Google, find out. Uh, some clubs are open to public, other clubs are not. So I found, uh, at that time, I found Siemens Toastmasters and Great Valley Toastmasters, which is close to me. Um, I went to Siemens Toastmasters um, and I loved that group. So I didn't go to anywhere else. I was stuck and for 11 years, I actually moved to New Jersey and then I joined Brunswick Toastmasters. But I mean, I, I came back last year. So I rejoined, um, I, I call them my extended family, wow. which is a great group of people helping each other, um, telling the... Um, yeah. Advice, yeah. Advice and all that, yes. Has has Toastmasters, because it's a group of people, a lot of them are professionals, um, has ever led to business or referrals or anything like that? A lot of people are managers. A lot of people come uh, to get rid of the filler words, um, coherent speaking, and uh, uh, learn to how to uh, write a speech using the structure, because when you join Toastmasters, they will assign you a mentor and that mentor will um, sit, meet, in, speak, take notes. Afterwards, he will go over with you what you have done. I mean, there's nothing wrong, but when you, what you can improve, things like that. So I had uh, three mentors begin in the beginning and now I am a mentor. I also have three mentees. Um, now I have another 
one assigned to me. So we are working. It's not like you're sitting in a um, room and discussing like my mentee and I, we just go for hiking, biking and stop in a park and just discuss the topics and things like that. So we love it. Uh, but has it, uh, because it's it's sort of a networking group too, has it ever led to immigration clients or anything like that? Have people referred you clients from it? Um, yes, I, I got a couple of clients through the group, uh, people who know me, mm -hmm. call me and ask uh, to help their relatives. Yes, I did uh, in certain times, other times. So, yeah. Really neat. Yeah. So I, it's, I was going to sign up for them right before COVID started. And then, and then it, uh, like on January, 2020, I was like, okay, but it took me a while to, to sit down because there's so many different uh, Toastmaster groups in Los Angeles that I was researching which one to go. And then I was going to go and visit a couple to see how it lives. And then, uh, you know, COVID mm -hmm. happened. I'm like, well, I'm not going to leave the house for another two years. So um, then that kind of fell apart, but seeing that list on your LinkedIn uh, reminded me of, of what I wanted to do with them. So it's an interesting thing to do. But it's virtual. It's virtual now. You know, yeah. oh. the, my club has hybrid meetings. If you would like to go, you can go. But if you would like to join uh, through um, Zoom, like we do, mm -hmm. you can do that. So that's like different... Um, way of doing things because when you go in person it's different but now you have to learn the uh, tips how to speak through zoom yeah how to use your gestures and facial expressions and things like that so um, i participate every wednesday um, 12 to 1 and and they are pretty good at ending at one o'clock because they all work and they, now it's the Cerna Toastmasters in Melbourne, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's in this with, inside the Cerna Corporation, but we joined through the Zoom, and it's it's been great because I don't sit here and take and talk to them. Real good. So, um, what are your plans for? You know, it's halfway through the year. Um, you work for this firm. What? How does the next year or two look for you and your practice, and and you know, immigration law operations for yourself? Mm, what I wanted to do is that be more, um, sort of like, and become an expert in business immigration. So there are a lot of areas to cover, right? Yeah. So I am, um, I, my forty is now. I went forties, forty fives, HS perms, especially perms. Um, but I wanted to learn other areas, you know, it's, it's just like immigration is vague, as you know, right? So there's family, there's, uh, I, I kind of uh, wanted to stick to this business immigration area and uh, improve myself. If someone can ask me a question, I know the answer like this. So yeah. that's, that's my goal. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how long it will take to get there. Oh, you're already probably there with all these years of experience. Uh, is, is there within yeah. business immigration, do you have a preference for like any NIVs, IVs, or like L's or worst perm? Is there any particular one that you like the most? Mm, not really, because if you are narrowed down your practice into one area, let's say I, I only take perm cases, then I don't know anything happened around. I, I'm kind of wanting to know everything. Yeah. Um, because I, if someone have a conversation in business section, for example, and even though I don't do that practice, I would read that and just take, take mental notes. Yeah. And that's how I want to progress forward. Um, so I don't like to stuck into one specific area in business immigration, but I want to be within the parameters of business immigration. Yeah. It's like it's it's gonna to be too much if you're gonna do family business and litigation and all that. Yeah. So that for sure is gonna to be too much. Uh, yeah, I've seen people mm -hmm. who like know of like even within business the EB they know like how to respond to like like your your, your article about I one forty I like particular topics, but they're not broad. Like they won't know like how to do the consular processing portion potentially or adjustment of status of course stuff that they need to know. So it's a it's a thing you got to know a little bit of everything, but then more and more when you when you get down to what you do. But you got to spot stuff like 
I remember I had a, I don't do humanitarian stuff typically. Uh, and I don't listen to TPS as much. Like when it happens, it doesn't happen. But I had a L1 I was doing and uh, it wasn't the strongest L1. And then I just like TPS for Yemen, those Yemenis family had been out for like months. And then like a week before the deadline for filing, I, I heard about it. I'm like, oh wait, maybe we should just do TPS for them just to have it. And I have to like figure mm -hmm. out what TPS, not the most complex kind of case, but I had to jump in there and learn it. So it's just one of those things you got to know everything, uh, but you got to know your, your, what you're doing day to day the best, but you got to keep an eye out on, on all these moving parts when it comes to immigration. I agree. I agree. I mean, um, if you jump in and take risks, that's only um, allowing you opportunity to learn other areas. Um, yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much. We'd love to have you on uh, more stuff. You already are an expert, in my opinion. So um, you know, <laughs> okay. any, any articles uh, CLE will start doing, we'd be, we'd love to do with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show again, Isna. All right. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you talking uh, about immigration and all the other stuff. And thank you. You're welcome. You know, when you're when you're into immigration law, like we are talking and thinking about it all day, it's a, it's a joy rather than like a hardship. So some people think about their work and like, oh, I have to study this. But we're like, oh, good. I'm excited. I learn new things. It's a lovely <laughs> area. If people want to reach out to, yeah. and, and contact you, are you on social media or is, what's the best way to, to do that? Um, yeah, they can go to our website, Scarborough Law LLC, and uh, there as a uh, form that they can fill and reach out. They can just say that I want to talk to Disna. Mm -hmm. Then, um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Stay on the line. We'll talk a little bit after the show. But everybody, check out uh, Disna's article in uh, the, the uh, in the issue four of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox uh, about I-140s. If you're in immigration doing you know i-140s you definitely need to read this and if you're trying to learn you're trying to get involved because you have a lot of people who are doing family stuff uh, immigration court stuff they want to get involved with business immigration this is a thing to know because it can really mess you up when ability to wage issues happen uh it's very problematic because you have to have ability to pay right after filing and some people think okay well, later on mm -hmm. the company's gonna make money and papers like no they're gonna judge it based on the day of filing and you don't want to find out two years yeah. later after going through all perm they're going to want to kill you if that happens. <laughs> I have a lot of Indian clients who have been waiting and waiting, and all of a sudden, like, what the hell? Like, this mistake happened? Like, and not, not my clients. I've had yeah. them all. Yeah, but, yeah. but it, it happens. Yeah. It, so it's a tricky thing. Yeah, that's why we take care of from the beginning. And I'm just very strict on that to check whether they have ability to pay. And I, we go through a list of documents to see like at least uh, they can provide at the end so yeah. you, you're going to get the, that assurance um, that's one of the things that you have to do you know how much of a checklist do you put i'm trying to create checklists because they i keep reading these business books and like you have to have standard operating procedures and checklists and everything so we started mm -hmm. doing some checklists for example how to do a foia and then so like staff members could learn how to do a freedom of information request and then the checklist became like a hundred things and i'm like this is kind of overwhelming um, how, how deep are your checklists or reviews with uh, staff members? Uh, if it's Our checklist basically one page long, um, I would say, but we, we kind of divided into segments. For example, let's say it's a, an L1A case. So uh, we just go by employer's information mm -hmm. and then qualifying relationship, what documents goes yeah. under that. And then uh, whether the uh, employee has that one year out of three years, that part. Yeah. And then employee's personal information. So we kind of categorize and under that we list the documents. Okay. Uh, I try not to go over one page, but sometimes it does, depending on the case, how complex it is that they have to explain certain things. Other than that, basically pretty much one page. Well, thank you so much. I, I, it's gonna help a lot of people with that information. Um, so I've said that, yeah, stay on the line a little bit. I look forward to working together uh, more. Uh, check out uh, this is an article in, on immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com slash magazine. You'll find um, that issue number four, the latest issue number five, uh, and all the future ones there. Uh, and if you want to, you know, uh, get updates and stuff, you're an immigration attorney, send me your email address, and I'll put you as part of our news list. So as these new magazine, the articles come, interviews come, you'll get updates on that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.